Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear participants. As Associate Dean of HFGV Direito São Paulo, I'd like to say that it's a great pleasure to have you all here to start this last section of the first University of Chicago Law School, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, Direito Rio and São Paulo, in this forum in law and economics in Brazil. This online first forum, Chicago FGV, fulfills, at least in part, the purpose of taking forward the joint initiative of our law schools to organize annual meetings on law and economics in Brazil. We believe this online forum is a good sample of what we expect to do face to face next year in Sao Paulo in Rio. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, Omri ben Shaha and Todd Henderson from the University of Chicago Law School and Rodrigo Viana and Antonio Maristrello Porto from FGV Direito Rio. I'm grateful for all their energy and enthusiasm to organize these ventures. Our special thanks to the Chicago and FGV teams that spare no effort to make this event happen in the best possible way. Before you start, I would like to remind you that all statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone presents here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will and they consented to be hackered and, uh, uh, in this broadcast, uh, which will be posted later at FGV's and Chicago University official channels. I also would like to remind you that it's possible to send comments or questions through a Slido link from the YouTube description. Please feel free to do so. This week, we are debating the economic analysis of consumer contracts. This afternoon, we'll have a lecture by Professor Luciano Tim, our dear colleague from FGV Direita SP. Professor Luciano Tim is a former National Consumer Secretary at Ministry of Justice, former president of the Brazilian Association of Law and Economics, and currently a member of the National Consumer Protection Council at Ministry of Justice. I'm sure that you have a very fruitful uh, discussion this afternoon. Many thanks, Professor Tim, for accepting our invitation to participate in such initiative. Please, you have the digital floor. Thank you all. Have a good lecture. Thank you, Ms. Padua Lima. I would like to thank FGV and uh, Chicago Law School for this kind invitation, for being part of this uh, event, which for me is something unique, something I have been working for for quite a long time, being a scholar of law and economics in Brazil for more than 10 years and at least for three years at FGV. With honor, I have this position at this great law school. Um, and I would like to especially thank Professor Todd Henderson and Professor Omri ben uh, from Chicago. I have been there uh, at the Coe's Center of Law and Economics, the father of law and economics, and give the name of this Institute of Law and Economics at uh, the law school uh, uh, there. And I have this great time there researching and thinking about the possibility of uh, exchanging ideas. So. Uh, uh, Many thanks, Ms. Padua, for putting this event uh, with them. And uh, even having this uh, through the internet, that's what we can have right now. But uh, I hope next year science gives us uh, uh, light, <laughs> enlightenment uh, with the vaccine that uh, would give us the possibility of uh, having a joint event uh, in physical pres presence, let's say. So I would, I would like to share my <clears throat> my uh, slides uh, by which uh, I will conduct this uh, lecture. Um, I would like also to say hello to all uh, of the people who are joining us uh, through the internet again. I, I hope that there are many FGV students, both uh, 
from postgraduate and undergraduate as well, and from the US. Um, so we're gonna talk about consumer protection in Brazil from a law and economics perspective. I will just uh, make sure that uh, I have my time with me. And uh, I hope also that we will have the time for discussions. So this lecture will uh, deal with um, some, some of the tools in consumer protection under Brazilian law uh, regarding abusive clauses, price caps, strict liability, and the right to be informed from a law and economics perspective. And I would also would like to talk about some implications of adopting OECD recommendations in consumer protection policy in Brazil. Uh, it's well known that Brazil would like to join and have applied for being part of OECD. And this has some, some implications for our consumer uh, policy. First of all, uh, especially for international audience, we have to say that uh, under Brazilian law, consumer protection is a fundamental right foreseen in Article 5 of, of our federal constitution and other state constitutions have the same fundamental right. Um, so it's differently from the US, especially in other countries in which uh, consumer protection is not a fundamental right foreseen under the black letter of the constitution. Um, and <clears throat> consumer protection is also a principle of economic law. Brazil has a chapter of the constitution dealing with economic law differently again from the US uh, and uh, consumer protection is a principle as well, among other principles like environmental protection, uh, labor protection and free market uh, as well. Um, this provision, this constitution provision was implemented uh, in the federal consumer protection and defense code. It's a federal law. We call it CDC um, and added by some state and municipal law, laws. It's a complex system. And this law created what we call the system of consumer protection, which is organized through the following entities. Senacom at the Ministry of Justice, the federal entity, plus PROCONS that are the regulators from state and municipal municipalities. There are more than 900 regulators in Brazil, which is odd comparing to the US uh, from this standpoint. There's also federal and state prosecutors. They are part of this system as well. Um, there are also public defenders, federal and state, and NGOs are also part of this system. So Brazil has a system of protection, like Brazil has also a system, uh, public health system, differently from the US, and we also have this uh, protection system. How this works, <clears throat> so how is the, the enforcement? Federal and state prosecutors can investigate and bring collective lawsuits, the Americans call it class actions, before state or federal courts. Uh, the implications are civil, uh, indemnizations and criminal sanctions. <clears throat> criminal sanctions is not often in consumer cases is more liability, civil liability, depending on the jurisdiction, state or federal. Uh, there are also the possibility that um, public defenders bring cases before courts defending consumer rights. <clears throat> and PROCONS and SENACOM, they are part of the administrative branch of the government, so they, they can bring administrative cases uh, and the result could be an administrative penalty. So uh, companies can be brought before courts for criminal and civil sanctions and before administrative courts uh, for administrative fines. Uh, in Brazil, administrative decisions can be reviewed by the court and this creates even more case, uh, <laughs> cases before courts. In this system, enforcement system, consumers can also bring cases individually before especially small claim courts, what we call the pequenas causas or juzado especial. 
<clears throat> and uh, NGOs can also bring collective lawsuits, lawsuits. And the result of that is over 6 million pending cases before Brazilian courts, which is according to the National Council of Justice, and more than 30 million cases of consumer protection in, on its database, which is of course too much. The level of what we call in Brazil judicialization is too high and actually too expensive for taxpayers uh, because the courts are subsidized by taxpayers and uh, all these cases are by implication subsidized by taxpayers and this creates some, uh, <clears throat> what we could say, a distributive problem and cross-subsidiarization cross uh, problem because poors are actually paying for, uh, let's say, richer have access to courts. But this is a law in economics and we could go back to that further. Uh, there's also a, a project in which United Nations is calculating the costs of this administrative uh, 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 PROCONS and SENACOM system. So we can also see that it's too costly and uh, we can do some level of trade-offs between costs and benefits, which is important for law and economics. Um, so let's talk a, a little bit uh, what we have in mind when we talk about consumer protection in Brazil. Of course, there's a trade-off between fairness and welfare. This is well debated in law and economics. Uh, many consumer protection scholars, NGOs, and regulators believe that consumer rights in Brazil are fundamental rights and related to fairness and distributive justice. Uh, not an efficient uh, discussion, efficiency discussion, so more related to distributive justice. Uh, they tend to see the consumers as the vulnerable and weaker party to be protected against companies and normally based uh, on an interpretation uh, of uh, a zero-sum uh, uh, perspective in which uh, companies can only benefit or increase its welfare uh, harming the consumers. There's uh, this view that is, this is a, a zero-sum game. Um, it would be impossible for companies to increase its welfare without harming consumers. Um, and there, there's a disregard of a pragmatic uh, and a consequential approach to legal issues in which we would think about reality and uh, implications in the real world and how it costs. Um, so it's a very dogmatic um, in the tradition of civil law jurisdiction, something that Americans, North Americans are not used uh, since the legal realism and pragmatism uh, took over the academic system. But here it's very dogmatic and, and uh, without um, use of uh, consequential approach and especially cost benefit analysis. <clears throat> And why we have this view in Brazil uh, that could, we could say to a certain extent this uh, view that is quite generalized. Um, well, there's the, still there's the inflation background uh, that built NGOs and some uh, consumer protection agencies that came from Sunabi uh, which was an entity to control prices before the privatization and democratization of the country. Uh, and so, you know, people are used to think about price control and during pandemics, this came along. We're going to talk about this later on. Um, so there's a kind of mistrust of a market system in the, in the background, let's say. Um, there's also a lack of economic background in law schools, resulting in some prejudice against, uh, to some extent, microeconomics, law and economics, and even economic law. Uh, and some law and econo uh, some economic law professors don't study economics, which for me is quite surprising. Um, 
with, it would be like being a, a philosophy of law teacher without studying philosophy uh, or being a sociology of law scholar without studying sociology. So how can one be uh, an economic law professor without having a basic knowledge, I would say, of economics as a science? And economics is a science such as medicine is a science. Uh, the same science that will bring, uh, hopefully, the vaccine. Uh, economics has its own uh, rules and principles. Um, and also, I would say, I would dare to say that um, there, there's a political and a ideological capture uh, in law schools agencies, uh, prosecutors, and public defenders. I'm not generalizing, but by and large, this is a phenomena that has been described in the literature. Um, in the US and in Brazil, wouldn't be different uh, as uh, acknowledged by Professor Sustin, an openly Democrat scholar that has worked uh, in Obama administration saying that there's a real problem in humanities uh, in which you know there's a, a, a bias um, that he brings with uh, uh, some some evidence saying that uh, we should be more diverse uh, in an academic system and in law this would be having more law and economics and pro-market uh, um, learning in, in, in law school <clears throat> there are also the literature of um, <clears throat> Pinker in Enlightenment Now. He also acknowledged this problem that humanities has been becoming less and less keen to accept uh, uh, scientific evidence and scientific discussions. So it's a problem because economics is a science. Uh, so normally in Brazil, law scholars don't have uh, the tools to discuss statistics and, and uh, methodological science. So it bring, opens too much the space for uh, what we call the system one, which is very uh, in neuroscience related to uh, dogmatic thinking, ideological thinking, political thinking without using the, the, the system that is responsible for system two, calculus, pragmatic approach and using scientific evidence. <clears throat> it has been happening with medicine, but it's also happening with economics and other sciences, as, as those scholars, uh, very uh, recognized scholars are acknowledging here. But this is uh, controversial, but I wouldn't uh, avoid this controversial discussion in such a high level uh, <clears throat> space. Uh, but now being more objective and saying uh, that uh, we could use law and economics uh, in favor or to justify the economic uh, protection of consumers or the economic regulation uh, on consumer benefit. Or in other words, the, uh, uh, we could find law and economics justification for consumer law. And this would basically be related to what we call in law and economics market failures. I think any um, uh, serious economist uh, would recognize that markets can have and often have failures. And that's what Ronald Coase, which gives the name, who gave the name to the Institute at University of Chicago, uh, would recognize that markets might and normally have failures, <clears throat> mainly uh, what we call asymmetric information. Uh, consumers have less information than companies in the market, which is a market failure, and it's more, more costly for them to obtain information. Uh, companies would have uh, more information, it's less costly for them even to produce information and to obtain information from consumers to use the information they got, they get, uh, especially through the big tech companies nowadays and to explore um, <clears throat> consumer, consumers' vulnerabilities. Other, uh, <clears throat> other problems uh, that uh, law and economics uh, acknowledge to justify consumer protection 
is uh, problems of, are problems uh, of quality. Uh, we uh, normally discuss in wine economics uh, Akerlof <coughs> uh, Lemon paper, in which, as a result of asymmetric information, consumers are too much driven by costs. So having very low costs would wash up companies with more quality. So consumers could end only with uh, poor quality products driven by this uh, <clears throat> uh, being too much uh, focus on, on price um, and not having enough information to uh, realize the quality of goods that are on the market. There's also a problem of decision-making. Uh, consumers, um, as I mentioned before, consumers tend to use uh, it, the, the, the system one of taking decisions. So when consumers go to market, they take decisions not, on, not exactly in the system two, the, the system related to making calculus and, and being pragmatic and thinking about cost benefits, but more in terms of emotions and things that could be explored, not in a bad sense, by, by, by marketing. <clears throat> so this is something to be uh, looked at by regulators and by the law. There's also room for opportunism in, by which companies could explore the asymmetric information, this decision-making process and something to be <clears throat> Uh, assessed by, by regulators. And if there's a problem of asymmetric information, my market failures, the lack of consumer protection could give bad information for the market and inform badly uh, competitors. So um, <clears throat> consumer protection is the other side of the coin of competition law. Uh, so I tend to think that economic law, and that's what is stated in our constitution, is formed in one hand by the competition law, handled by CAGI, our antitrust agency, and the other side of the coin is uh, consumer protection. So one is demand side, consumer protection, and the other one is supply side. And both are part of economic law. That, I think that is one important lesson and something that we could think about uh, because in the US, FTC, the Federal Trade Commission takes uh, care of consumer protection as well as antitrust. And I think this could be efficient as a model. How consumer, uh, how are our consumer code deals with uh, these issues? I mean, the main principles to regulate the market. And I think this consumer protection, um, besides being a fundamental right, is regulation. And by implication, being regulation, uh, the, the economic liberty law uh, applies, uh, in which there are some limits for regulation uh, and intervention within the market. Um, so one of this the main right of consumers is the right to be informed so companies have the right to inform consumers and there's always the issue of how much of information uh, uh, consumers should be uh, informed about and and professor shahar has an important book uh, about uh, and, and 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 the title is more information than we want companies are producing too much information without being efficient. But there's this right to be informed. Um, consumers also have the right of, uh, that the judge could shift the burden of proof uh, because the idea is that um, if it's easier to, to win the case, a, a liability case, a tort case, this could make the consumer protection more efficient. So the consumers, if there is a shift of the burden of proof, consumers wouldn't need to bring evidence about fault of companies. There's also the principle of strict liability. So again, uh, 
um, the, there's no assessment about fault. Um, and it's coherent with the idea of uh, uh, cheapest cost avoider that uh, law and economics of, of Professor Calabresi is, uh, his paper on that subject is well known. Uh, meaning that the companies are can avoid the the, the accident uh, with a lower cost than consumers. Uh, consumer code also uh, uh, have this rule on uh, the, what we call chain responsibility. Americans would classify probably as a, a joint and severely liable uh, principle. Uh, by which manufacturers, important importers, merchants, they are all in the same chain and could be responsible for the good or service that they put uh, in the market for consumers in a strict liability rule. Um, and there's also the protection against abusive clauses and abusive commercial practices. And this is important to say that it's quite unique for Brazil. Some, some uh, other Latin American countries also have that, but may, maybe not at that extent that we have in Brazil. Um, those protection are what we call of the public or they cannot be waived. These rules of the uh, consumer could, could not be waived by the contract among consumers and, and, and companies. Um, they simply apply and, and could not be waived by any means. Uh, how consumer, how law and economics could help uh, the study and the analysis and the efficiency of this uh, consumer protection system? It gives the opportunity to use. Uh, cost-benefit analysis uh, in the um, assessment of this public policy of protecting consumers. And I will give some examples later on. But uh, of course, at least according to law and economics perspective, there are consequences of excessive paternalism. If there's too much intervention to protect supposedly the weaker party, the weaker party could, or the poorer, could even play, uh, pay higher prices of goods and, and of course pay higher taxes because if there's there are six million cases in the uh, cases pending in courts taxpayers are paying for that and of course paying a more expensive price so there's an implication uh, the more you go with paternalism i'm not saying that some level it's wouldn't be efficient but if you go uh, too much, the price uh, would have uh, this uh, implication. You pay more. And there's always this trade off. Uh, and law and economics could help that. The cost benefit analysis is one of the main lessons uh, or recommendations by o OECD guidelines. And Brazil has applied for that. And Brazil. Uh, is aiming at applying all recommendations in consumer protection policy uh, now. So uh, once it's adopted, we're going to have to use cost-benefit analysis, which is also uh, what is under the the economic the, uh, the 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 law of economic freedom, what we call um, as well. Uh, if we use law and economics, we have also to admit that competition is a way, competition law is a way to protect consumer welfare as well. So not only the consumer code and consumer agencies protect consumers. If we boost competition by having a more uh, options, more companies, the prices tend to decrease and the quality increase. That's the general rule. It goes without saying, so if that is true, if agencies regulates properly the market, and we know from law and economics pers perspective that there are some um, uh, 
there are some problems with study capture theory. We know that there are some limitations and that the government also has failures. Not only the market has failure or failures, government also has failures. But if agencies, uh, and even Professor Posner recognized, if agencies work properly, it could increase and can increase consumer welfare. It's not only consumer agencies, again, that would increase the welfare of consumers. They should all work together. Again, as I mentioned, FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in the US deals with consumer protection and um, data protection, and um, which is also something that we have to deal. We have the, the, this new data law uh, and uh, FTC also takes care of, of uh, competition law. We, we have this separated in Brazil, Senacom and Procons and the other members of the system takes care of consumer protection. CADI, our antitrust agency, uh, takes care of competition, but they should work together as well as, as agencies. And that's why the consumer, uh, the, the Council of Consumer Protection was recreated in order to put together all agencies, CADI and, 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 and and the, the, the system of consumer protection uh, in the same boat and rowing to the same side uh, and bringing more efficient regulations to increase welfare of consumers. Also behavior analysis uh, and game theory could be used um, because once we know that firms are rational economic agency, <clears throat> agents, we all know that they could explore the slowness of the courts uh, not, to, <laughs> not to respect consumer rights. So some people would say that having 6 million cases is good for consumers because this would mean that they have access to courts. But if we are, if we are pragmatic and, and we, we, we start to think in the strategic terms, um, this could be true, but also uh, it's, this is part of the story because the other part of the story is that if companies are economic agents and rational, and I think they are, they could simply use the slowness of the courts as a strategy not to follow it, not to follow the the black letter of the law and use it strategically, and actually it could be efficient not to respect the law. Uh, and to uh, make profit of this situation. I'm not saying that this is uh, ethical, and if it's ethical or not, this would be a philosophical issue to be discussed by philosophy of law, which is an interesting discussion, but not the discussion that I'm proposing here. Um, <clears throat> and also, if we use law in economics, uh, and it's uh, recognized by behavioral law in economics, that behavioral law in economics is part of the law and economics movement. It's in a way uh, an amelioration of, uh, of, the, of the predictability of the model because um, it, it, it's not saying that uh, economic agents are totally irrational, but if the level of irrationality could be corrected by some nudges. So consumer regulators, uh, Consumer law regulators could use nudges, and nudges are uh, there are some rules, you know. So uh, even Professor Sustin uh, calls himself a, a, a libertarian paternalist. So it's not the paternalism that uh, some consumer scholars, consumer law scholars, uh, defend in Brazil. So you, you only create nudges that are efficient from an economic standpoint. They are not costly for the state and it does not derive consumer from, from their choices. And we also uh, have to admit that ODR, the online dispute resolution uh, mechanisms and, and ADR, uh, alternative dispute resolution systems could help consumers. We should, and FGV has an interesting project on that, on both of these projects 
run by Professora uh, Juliana Loss, FGV Real, with uh, among other scholars, um, that are working for uh, in favor of ODRs and ADRs, such as the Ministry of Justice, Senacom, uh, has also what we call consumidor.gov.br. Uh, it is considered by some scholars as the most efficient ODR platform uh, in the world, actually. Uh, it sold last year uh, more than 700,000 cases with 80% uh, of uh, result in six, I'm saying again, six days. So it's much more efficient than courts. So we should invest in that sort of mechanism to solve disputes and create the rights and create the right incentives for companies to really um, respect consumer rights rather than exploring the slowness of the courts. So let's let let me give you some examples on on how that would work. Law and economics uh, in uh, <clears throat> in practice in consumer protection. Uh, one, the, the first example is the price gouging uh, during the pandemic. Our CDC prohibits the increase on price without just cause, um, which is quite controversial. Uh, I wrote an article uh, saying that uh, jurists and philosophers are trying to limit prices on this basis of just price since Middle Ages, Middle Ages and this is, has not been uh, this have not been very efficient since then, but anyway, our CDC, for the reasons I stated before, uh, prohibits increase on price without just cause. This is difficult. It's a very vague uh, language of the law. Some PROCONs, the, the, the state agencies, uh, limited profit margins, which is kind of unique in comparative law, saying that merchants could not increase um, margins uh, on their profits during the pandemic. Um, and oddly enough, some state legislation legislators passed laws to prohibit the increase of prices during pandemics, considering the prices before the pandemics and after the pandemics. And I give the surprising example of the state of Rio that now has even a problem with its government. But anyway, um, <clears throat> Senacom used law and economics um, to uh, foresee or to sort of uh, uh, give some orientation about what would that mean, uh, increase price increase without just cause in a technical note. It's not a binding. Uh, um, orientation, but um, it's um, it's a way to give some level of uh, legal certainty and predictability. And uh, price increase without just cause was defined as an opportunistic behavior of companies that increase increase prices without an uh, without economic rationale. And and what would that mean, I mean, that would be uh, something that uh, would not have an economic explanation, uh, such as price increase, which is not the result of a supply or demand shock. Let me give the example. The beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a substantial increase on price of masks, surgical masks and hand sanitizers. I'm talking about more than 100%. So this increase on price was abusive or not, has a cause or not. And the cause here is not philosophical, it's economic cause, it's science. Uh, and microeconomics, basically. So what Senacom did was Senacom notified all the uh, chain of producers and merchants in this those two markets, masks and hand sanitizers, to understand uh, what was happening. And what was happening was that, for instance, masks 
a substantial part of mask production, uh, surgical mask production in the world was China. And not surprisingly, uh, in the region of um, where the pandemic started, uh, Wuhan. And the Chinese lockdown is lockdown, you know. So uh, this region stopped simply uh, everything for two, almost two months. So there was no production of masks during two months. So a supply shock. But there was the pandemic in addition to that, which meant the demand of all the world by masks from China. So a, sup, uh, a, a, a demand uh, shock. So in that case of mask, there was supply as well as a demand shock. So that's why the price by and large increased. So if the merchant that was importing masks from China before pandemic was paying, and that was more or less the figure, was paying $5 for, for the box. After this situation, the same merchant was paying, and he brought evidence about that, was paying $100. So if the merchant simply pass along the increase of costs he had, he's not acting you know, in, uh, in, in an opportunist, opportunistic behavior. So the, the way that the government, Sena, solved the problem at that time was to work with Anvisa, the, the regulator of, uh, uh, of um, drug, uh, that would be the, uh, the dr drug regulator in the US. Um, <clears throat> allowing the, uh, uh, the, the, the small merchants to produce uh, domestic masks according to some rules. And that uh, increase in the supply side uh, of, of masks uh, uh, ended up resulting in a decrease of price and increasing of competition. So the way that Sena Consul and the government as a whole solved the problem was more market and not less market. Because can you imagine if the, if you were living in a socialist country with a economic uh, planification uh, uh, center that had planned last year in 2019, uh, the number of masks we would be using this year, the world would be in serious problems. Um, and also hand sanitizer. Um, and there was also a campaign with hand sanitizer. So the problem was more or less not exactly the same because the, the, the producers were not all of them in China. But of course, the producers of hand sanitizers uh, were not prepared for this increase um, of, of the demand. So it took some time for, for the supply adjust to the demand because when the price is high, it's an invitation for competitors to enter in this market because the profits are, are high and it's above the average of the market. So, and there, there was also a campaign to clarify to consumers to wash their hands by soap, which is a substitute if you are at home to hand sanitizer with the same efficiency. So that's a way that uh, the, this, uh, the case was dealt with using law and economics to a large extent. And recently there's the case of the rice. And uh, again, um, some procons thought that um, um, the increase of price of the rice could be abusive and the only way to know if it's abusive or it has a just cause is notifying the chain to understand what's happening in this market the simple notification to understand the market does not mean price cap or price or fixing the price that would be something that the governor of sao paulo did in the gas 
and did with rice to a certain extent, and I think it's the wrong path. But uh, but the, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, it's a federalistic system, and 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 um, states have their own uh, autonomy to implement uh, consumer policies, protection policies. Another example uh, of law and economics is how Senacon dealt with. Uh, 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 recall um, of products, um, ordinance, what we call Portaria 618, 2019, the Ministry of Justice uh, reorganized recall system and reshaped the recall system in which, um, well, there was the data that, um, that con Brazilian consumers were too optimist and not following recall recalls run by companies. So one thing was to increase the level of information um, because if you give the right information through the right channels, you would reach more consumers. Uh, and we know that uh, a lot of people are not watching TV anymore. And uh, according to the previous ordinance, all the campaigns, uh, alert campaigns, should be run by on, on, on the traditional media, newspapers and television. So the new ordinance opened that uh, for campaigns through the internet, websites of the companies and increasing, of course, the, the, the how information would reach consumers in a in a in a less costly system even even to companies because they were producing campaigns without any uh, significant result uh, and paying advertisements for creating a, let's say a market that is elusive in a way because consumers were not following the campaigns. Uh, and uh, also the, the ordinance uh, adopted OECD guidelines of behavioral insights, which is behavioral law and economics. I have talked about that earlier in order to convince consumers to bring product products to recall. So in a way, the idea is to how you use some nudges for consumers to respect these uh, campaigns and uh, follow the recall campaigns. And uh, I think everybody knows how, uh, uh, how uh, the package of uh, cigarettes have some uh, advertisements that would create alerts in which consumers would be uh, informed about uh, in a very shocking way, so to speak, uh, about the effects of uh, consuming cigarettes and cigars as well. I saw in a package uh, lately. Uh, and bringing this to recalls, for instance, Honda created an, a campaign in which a consumer that knew before that he should follow the campaign uh, of a recall, but did not respect it and had an accident. Um, and this was related to Takata airbags. And uh, when you go to the, uh, uh, and I'm not doing this to, uh, sort of uh, make a campaign in favor of this brand. But uh, uh, just to say that Honda has a better uh, reach of achievement of its campaigns rather than other car manufacturers. And maybe, maybe we need evidence probably because they're using these more efficient behavior insights. Uh, now talking about uh, how um, we could use uh, the consumer code in order to avoid the, the, um, the exploitation of the vulnerabilities of the decision-making process. Senacom opened an investigation against Facebook uh, based on how Facebook would gather data, um, gather, uh, gather uh, <clears throat> data about uh, its consumers. And first of all, uh, uh, this is, was something new because even 
uh, in situations in which consumers are not directly paying, like in the case of Facebook, because there's no payment, consumers are paying through their data. So it's a consumer relationship and consumer code applies. Um, and it was considered that the system by which Facebook gathered information and gathered consent from consumers are abusive under the rules of consumer code. And is abusive because it gathers information about the friends of the people who give their um, acceptance. And this was considered uh, uh, abusive. Um, so it was an interesting case in which um, I think in a way this has been very controversial and uh, it's in fashion nowadays, maybe uh, some uh, Netflix documentaries are exaggerating a little bit, uh, but uh, it's something that is, uh, you know, very um, present at nowadays discussion. So um, the PDC, which is part of Senacom, convicted uh, uh, Facebook uh, uh, and understood that the business model of automatic sharing information of friends, of people who accept uh, a standard of waiving their rights is abusive. And uh, it's against not the data protection law, which will come into force now in a few months, but, um, um, but according to the CDC, the Consumer Protection Code. Um, well, and, 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 and now um, how, and, and, and I, I mentioned earlier, um, the enforcement of consumer protection nowadays is still depending on a lot of litigation. So we should talk about law and economics before the court. So law and economics has landed at the federal Supreme Court. The, the president, the newly appointed president of the Supreme Court is uh, also a scholar, a procedural law scholar that um, is using uh, on his votes law and economics. A student of mine presenting, presented a master's uh, thesis by which according to the right uh, methodological uh, model, he brought evidence how this uh, 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 um, judge um, or justice, as Americans would say, how this justice of the federal Supreme Court uh, uh, open uh, a new era of, of law and economics in Brazil using not economic rationale, but using law and economics on his opinions and bringing judges to work with him judges that also have this knowledge of um, law and economics, such as Judge Bodar from the State Court of Rio, who has studied uh, in the US and now is the president of the Brazilian Law and Economics Association. So uh, there are cases uh, even help, in a way, increasing the benefit of consumer, uh, uh, increasing the welfare of consumers in Brazil such as the case in which uh, Justice Fuchs uh, considered that um, municipalities could not regulate uh, the transportation of uh, technology mobility companies like Uber. Uh, and of course, the competition between Uber, other companies with taxi drivers, I think there are good arguments and good evidence that that increase um, the welfare of consumers. Again, uh, we should think about ways to increase um, consumer welfare, not necessarily by means of applying in a paternalistic way, the consumer protection code. And I think this is a way um, that uh, uh, we could uh, bring this argument that uh, uh, by having competition, the Supreme Court uh, permitted an increase of welfare of consumers having Uber and other 
technological companies uh, competing against taxes. And <clears throat> last but not least, uh, there are some, um, uh, there, there, are, there are many uh, ca uh, cases, uh, not from the Supreme Court, but from, from the federal courts, uh, especially our superior court of justice in which law and economics was applied. And I would make this argument that Brazilian judges, and this is something maybe surprising, surprising for uh, common lawyers, uh, that actually Brazilian judges have more discretion than in the US because it's foreseen by the law that there are some cases that could be considered as binding by and large precedents are not respected, still not respected. And I think uh, this is something that uh, Justice Fuchs will address and mention that would be one of his uh, main uh, public policies to be implemented at the, the Supreme Court and, and actually the National Council, Council of Justice, which is the body that um, takes care of, of this uh, judicial public policy. Um, we'll have to address this. Uh, uh, the res that the judges should respect the precedents and this is necessary for having foreseeability, predictability, and, uh, and having this is important for economic development. But having said, Having said that, um, Brazilian judges have a lot of discretion. Uh, there's no binding uh, precedent. This, well, we have in you know, a small situations, as I mentioned. But um, so, and law is written, as I gave the example of abusive uh, prices, is written in and found in a generic and vague principles, which gives room for a lot of discretion. Judges frequently quote scholars uh, to try to solve this uh, vagueness of the black letter of the law. And there's a leading case of law and economics uh, at the Superior Court of Justice in, in which the justice applied correctly law and economics um, analysis and could be used as a leading case not in the way that common lawyers would use, but uh, as a leading case for our, in our culture, so to speak. And <clears throat> the case I quote here, and uh, it, it was a case in which the court discussed the social function of contract, something that um, we have in our civil code, something that could be weird for uh, common lawyers, but just the social function of contract and uh, I think it was a bad decision to bring this to the uh, text of the civil code, but this is already there, we have to deal with. Uh, and the court decided that uh, social function of contract should be assessed from a law and economics perspective in which uh, one should recognize the institutional and social role of the contract law and how it offered uh, for the market security and predictability. In a way, this is what we call uh, transaction costs and, 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 and contract law should be a way to decrease um, transaction costs and uh, economic freedom law also makes special reference to uh, transaction costs, also something unique. So there's room for actually uh, use law in economics and the case law of higher courts are uh, interesting from that uh, view. Um, we could say again that the court applied correctly the doctrine in a case in which the party was trying not to uh, respect the contract based on a vague principle of, uh, um, of of uh, social function of the contract, but the court said, well, social function of the contract is not, in a way, socialist function of the contract 
um, it's one has to bear in mind it's a free market eco uh, economy and uh, uh, the consequences should be uh, taken into account. There's also another uh, room to use law and economics, which is the law that we have on how judges should interpret the law, uh, the introduction of uh, norms. Uh, Article 20 talks about um, that judges in applying vague principles should be aware of the consequences. We would call that in law and economics, um, uh, the assessment of, um, of the impact of this intervention of the market. And um, in a way, in this uh, opinion, the, the Superior Court Justice said that legal certainty and forcibility to economic agents in transactions should be uh, bear in mind. And uh, judges should be aware about the consequences of their decisions for the market and how it would affect the, the, um, the assessment of the parties that uh, are investing and selling products and, and taking risks, which is in a way uh, uh, the secondary impact of a judicial decision as code would say. And Chicago Law School is mentioned uh, he, uh, uh, on this opinion. Um, so it's uh, a very uh, uh, interesting case law to be discussed. It, it's a consumer relationship because it's a relationship between a consumer and a bank. Um, even though parties were not discussing uh, the consumer code, but it's a consumer relationship. And the court really understood that uh, there's a mortgage loan agreement in which one agreement is connected to. And if one party does not respect the agreement, the other parties in this market could have to pay for this breach of contract. And if everybody does not respect the agreement, and uh, this would have an effect on prices. Um, well, and I think uh, that's it. I would stop from here and uh, would like to hear questions and have discussions with, uh, with our audience. Uh, Ms. Uh, Padua Lima, um, again, I'm happy to, and, and Ms. Mr. Jana would be happy to discuss with our audience uh, questions and, and criticism about my exposition. I know that some issues were controversial and it is good for discussion. I remember the old philosopher Socrates would was acknowledged by good questions and not by good answers. And I think I posed some good questions here and I'm, I'm, uh, maybe I'm not prepared for the right answer, but I think uh, we have some right question here. Thank you. Okay, many thanks Professor Tim for this valuable lecture. Now Thais, our research, please. Um, would you please uh, <clears throat> go ahead and uh, send the questions? questions. Sure, Maria Lucia. Um, so we have our first question from um, Danielle. He asks, I would like to hear your thoughts regarding matters that could be in the intersection between consumer, antitrust, and privacy regulation. Well, this is something that I have, have been involved uh, while I was at the, uh, I was at Senecom. Um, I think, um, as I mentioned, um, I would consider antitrust and consumer protection code CDC uh, part of economic law. And we have a chapter under our constitution dealing with economic law and both are principles. So we should uh, take into account that, um, uh, um, in antitrust law, there's this discussion that um, antitrust competition law is to protect the market or to protect consumers. Well, <laughs> market uh, is formed with people, and consumers are part of the market. So, if you if if you if you protect competition 
of course, you will end up protecting consumers, or at least you would end up increasing the the the, the welfare of consumers. So um, I cannot say that CAGI, our antitrust agency, does not protect consumers. And we actually, uh, uh, when I was at Senacom, we actually notify CAGI in some situations that we found that uh, there was a problem of competition that could decrease the welfare of consumers. I think more and more the pandemic is showing us how some, some technological companies are increasing their market power and that could bring problems for consumers. Um, and with regards to data uh, law, uh, again, uh, um, uh, the data law have has some rules regarding this relationship between um, uh, uh, technology users and, and uh, technology companies and how data are collected from people. Uh, Professor Shahar has a very interesting article about uh, what he called data pollution. Uh, it's an analogy of environmental pollution because data pollution um, spills, data spills could bring externalities um, not only to the person who had a problem of data breach, but to the society as a whole. Uh, there was a military base, uh, US military base, base this discovered by a terrorist group. Uh, and this military base uh, was uh, discovered because it was a, a app that would give information about people exercising. So uh, they found this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, military base in the middle of nothing because the military personnel was sharing data about their exercise. Of course, the, the only thing that they could do a military group in the middle of nothing was exercising and they, as a military, they have to do that. So they discovered, and, and this, in a way, it was a situation in which users were giving their consent, but the, 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 that situation, created an externality for the group. Um, so this is a, a connection between um, uh, technology apps, uh, users and, and companies that might have also consumer uh, impact. And uh, as, I, as I gave the example of the Facebook case, um, the way that Facebook gathered consent from the users could be seen in, in, in one way from, from a data protection authority uh, understanding and another understanding from the consumer regulators. And um, I think we have to uh, have all these authorities working together. And I think that's why, and I believe that's why when I was at this position at Senacom, we signed more than 10 cooperation agreements among uh, consumer regulators and uh, agencies, they have to work together. That's something that OECD has been insisting. The only way that companies are working in a, in a combined way, the government should do the same. The government should put everybody to work together and making a more efficient regulation. So we have a question from Ivo. Oh, he asks, do you agree that the Brazilian consumer protection laws are mostly mandatory rules, according to Professor Shahar's classifications of mandatory and default rules. And if that is the case, despite the lack of empirical and consequential analysis, wouldn't these be the best legal framework to defend consumer rights? Well, uh, you might have this argument, uh, this is mandatory according to uh, Professor Klesky. This would be mandatory and not waivable according to the general tier of, of, of law. Um, uh, Professor Shahar has, uh, has some discussions in which what would be more efficient, uh, information or, um, or this kind of regulation. Uh, um, and um, well, there, we need empirical evidence to assess which one would be more beneficial. And I think that's how law and economics could help us to assess the efficiency or the cost benefit analysis of the public policy. Um, and I think the, our, our, our law is sufficiently vague to permit regulators to use 
more or less from this regulation if we start to apply everywhere the rules of and principles of our consumer code we might end up we, we might end up like the governor of sao paulo who fixed the price of the gas which at the end of the day would increase the general price to be paid by consumers gas consumers in sao paulo and i think this is our last question for, for now uh... Daniel, another Daniel Matos asks, Professor, do you think interferences on economics distort prices? Uh, wouldn't it be better to just let economics adjust them along? <laughs> well, um, uh, well, as a legal scholar, we have to deal with uh, the black letter of the law. So we have this, uh, this rule Uh, and we have the, the principles that are um, foreseen in our consumer defense code. So um, we cannot simply say that the law should not be obeyed. This, this is something, another discussion that I, would, that I have been having. I mean, you, I mean the law should be uh, applied. Uh, so if we believe as a society that the law is inefficient, we should amend the law. Uh, we cannot rewrite, which is not rewritten. I think our Supreme Court has been going too much of uh, creating a law that does not exist. <laughs> so uh, I think we should start from a law in economics to respecting the law, uh, because that is the forcibility. Um, and, and this is important for investment and taking risks. Uh, I, I don't have problem saying that the market by and large solved the problem. Uh, and the price is something that I, sh if, I if I were uh, uh, drawing the law, I, should, I, I would avoid because trying to, to, to uh, fix price and control price, prices uh, never worked in Brazil, never worked. Uh, there are two countries that I know that uh, try to fix the prices during pandemics, Argentina and Venezuela. Uh, how it ended up? Well, the story said, uh, when you try to fix prices by regulation, you end up by consumers paying uh, through the lack of goods on the shelf of the supermarket. And I think that's the worst thing for consumers. I think in a, in a pro-market approach, it's better what our government did, and that's what Milton Friedman always said, it's better to give the money to people and they make their decisions. And if, if we are dealing, I'm not saying that we shouldn't help uh, people, we should help, we must help, but the best way is not trying to control the price, but uh, giving money to people and, and poor people and they making their decision. And this is another explanation of the rice. What the, why the price of the rice increased One of the explanations is that uh, this uh, money, that uh, transfer money that the government was giving to people, people that never received money, these people are going to the supermarket to buy rice and that increased the price of, uh, that increased the, the demand side of the rice. And this should be added to, and I forgot to explain this uh, also because uh, China bought basically all the rice <laughs> in uh, agreements in Brazil, in you know, uh, agribusiness agreements, you enter into in, a, in an earlier situation. So China bought a lot of the rice before, probably knowing about the situation that could uh, affect the world because they were the first to have the epidemic at that time. And so we have, again, this problem of supply and demand shock, which increased the price. If you try to fix, you might end up not giving the right incentive for the guy who will have to wake up every day at 5 p.m., go to the, you know, <laughs> plant the seed, et cetera, and collect the rice. And um, so, you know, uh, as a, uh, I, if I would have to say, uh, I would agree by and large that we shouldn't try to control pri prices, but we have this provision under the Consumer Protection Code. And I think the technical note from Senacom, it's quite rich in respecting uh, supply and demand 
uh, uh, law, which is an economic law that maybe it's stronger than the law that uh, lawyers produce because it's a law based on science and evidence. And not because of the will of the parliament or the will of the regulator. Okay, Thais, I guess uh, we don't have any uh, other questions, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. In this case, uh, no, uh, I, first of all, thanks so much, uh, Luciano, for this lecture. Uh, I really enjoy it personally. And I do hope you have enjoyed too this great opportunity. And uh, we have looking forward for meeting you personally in Sao Paulo in Rio next year. Once more, thank you so much, Luciano, Rodrigo, Thais, Vanessa, Kika, all our uh, team uh, from Sao Paulo in Rio, and of, of course from Chicago. And thank you all. Thank you for the, the, the audience. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you, Maria Luz. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys.